feature presentation. Mr. Mortensen, how are you, sir? Good. Hello, Eric. How are uh, you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. I wanted to ask you, the first time I had saw this movie was back at TIFF, and it was on September the 15th, and that was at the end of the festival, and I was surprised that you were still there, and your introduction was so genuine and sincere, and I wanted to ask you what it meant to you, not only to have the, the film play at TIFF, but also to screen the movie in the province of Ontario in which you had shot some of the film. Well, just like, I mean, unfortunately, Falling, the first movie I directed, because of the pandemic, I was not able to go. I had to appear by Zoom, and I think there was like, you know, 10 people allowed in the theater. It was yeah. kind of sad, including a, a few of the actors, the younger actors, and they went up on stage, and I was connected via screen. That was disappointing, because Toronto is a festival that I've gone to over the years many times with many different kinds of movies, and I've always loved showing a movie especially the first time um at toronto because toronto is a true audience festival it's it's unlike any other one in the sense that you have a cross-section of just average uh, cross-section of people you know population different ages different backgrounds and they're they're genuine in their appreciation you know they 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 buy their tickets all ahead of time they line up they they come with enthusiasm and just as it happened with Green Book in uh, 2018, I guess it was, um, they they sold out all the screenings and they added an extra one for the Dead Don't Hurt, just like they did for Green Book. And when I heard that, I said, well, I'm staying all week and I'm going to do Q&As. I'm going to appear for every single screening, which I did, including the last one, which you saw. And I loved it. It was what was great. The first time you show the movie, you don't know how people are going to react. You know, you may it may be the, the movie you wanted to make and you're happy with it, but you just don't know until you put it out there. And it's better to put it out not to an audience of sort of professionals and industry people that, you know, their attention span is different. Their interest in the movie is different. Maybe they're feeling competitive. Who knows what it is? Uh, or they're more focused on other things. The audiences at Toronto are passionate about seeing the movie and what was great is that it was a full house at the end of each screening, which is already encouraging. If you stay till the end and through the end credits, it means that there must be something that's working. And then they had great questions and observations, uh, as they always do at the festival. And and that was great. Very, I learned a lot from them, as Absolute, always. Absolutely. And you, and you get a sense, like you were mentioning, where, you know, it's an audience festival and the people that are coming to see the movie are, you know, enthusiastic to see the film. And it's not just simply about industry when it comes to buyers or selling or, you know, the buzz right. of the festival. And I think like that's or, or really going important. there to be seen or going there all dressed up to be seen by others. Oh, he was at the screening of I don't know what or the premiere of this and that. They're going because they want to see the movie. Yeah. And, and you feel that. And, and I wish that Tiff... Um, in in the uh, early 2000s uh, were adding screenings because I remember the first time that I ever went I was so adamant and wanting to see a history of violence and I could not get tickets to it and I ended up going to see the three burials of Milkyatus Estrada instead but I'll never forget like that first experience with TIFF but then you know as the the years have gone on it's just it's fascinating to see how important that festival is when it comes to you know showing the world to you know people yeah. and not just the industry I, yeah i didn't i mean i didn't have the same involvement uh, maybe in in history of violence i didn't think of it at the time but with green book when i heard it was sold out i said if you guys want to do another screening i'll, I'll show up and do a q a afterwards you know and they did that and so with the dead don't hurt immediately you know i suggested to them if you have a slot if there's a somewhere that we can show it, Scotia Bank, any one of them, um, you know, I'll I'll stay, you know, and and they they did that, so it's great that they're open to doing that, and that audiences, you know, appreciate that and come. Absolutely, I was curious about, and I know this might sound like a silly question, um, but I look at your filmography, and you know, 
Philip Ridley gets a, a special thanks at the end of the film and, and, you know, the reflecting skin in his amazing movie. But then I even look at films that you've worked on that would be considered, you know, Westerns, whether it be Jeff Murphy's Young Guns 2, but that has a surreal kind of quality to it as well. Or John Hillcott's The Road, uh, which you co-starred uh, with uh, Garrett Dillahunt in, in, in that movie. Do you consider the dead Appaloosa. don't Appaloosa, yeah. yes, Ed Harris's Appaloosa. Do you consider the dead don't hurt to be a Western because it feels like it's ever evolving throughout the film and not just one thing. What I set out to do anyway, was to make a classic Western, like the best of the ones I remember watching when I grew up, you know, when I started going to the movies and not, not copying any particular movie or any particular style, but sticking to certain traditions of the classic Western and that it occurs in the Western United States between 1860 and 1890, and that the photography is simple and elegant, where you don't think too much about how the camera is seeing the landscapes and the people in them. You just feel like you're there, or maybe you even want to be there, and that's it. And that the d details historically are 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 accurate. You know, I mean, you can do anything you want with a Western. Everybody could be wearing purple. It could be uh, wall-to-wall uh, -wall rap music soundtrack. You can do whatever you want. They can all be uh, Asian people. They can all be, you know, you can do anything you want. Of course you can. Um, there are many different, you know, there's Westerns by Sergio Leone, which I like a lot, but I don't consider them classic Westerns because I'm very conscious of what the camera's doing and the music is, is great, um, but it's overwhelming. It's a different thing. You know, I was trying to do something that, Everything that you see in here, including the music, feels like it's from that period. Within that, yes, we do some some things that are quite different. You have an ordinary woman at the center of the story, which never happens. You know, it's rare that you even have a woman be the lead in a western. It's, it's happened, but usually they're extraordinary women. Whether it's movies like uh, Forty Guns with Barbara Stanwyck or The Furies with Barbara Stanwyck, Walter Walter uh, Houston's last movie. Um, uh, Claudia Cardinale and Sergio Leone uh, movie, uh, you know, Marlena Dietrich, what have you. And, and you don't normally see an ordinary woman, you know, be, be the lead in, in, a, in a Western. I'm sure there were many Vivians. There were many, many women like the one Vicky Creeps plays in our movie. It's just that people were never interested in in the 19th century and writing that much about them, whether they be journalists or novelists. And then in terms of the genre, the Western film genre, you know, even female directors have not been that interested in, in telling their stories. There are, of course, the occasional, you know, I mean, there's Meeks cut off and there's certain ones, newer ones that do that, but, but normally it's not an ordinary woman who's playing who's playing the lead, you know, it's, it's, it's something different. Um, or you have some kind of exploitation situation where a woman takes up arms or a group of women take up arms and behave like violent men have behaved in Westerns traditionally and blow everyone away and kill all the bad guys, you know, but that's not realistic or historically accurate in my opinion. And it's not a classic Western. We tried to make a classic Western, but do some things different story-wise within that yeah and you, and you can see that though as well because because even though you're, you're talking about vivian as being an ordinary person and and sort of navigating her own life she still very much feels progressive in how she wants to present herself and her relationship with olsen the first time sort of they're together you know he mentions oh breakfast in bed and it's like well no this is not and then you go and sit and you know have a meal together but it feels very much like she still wants to be her own person and have that autonomy in her life and you even see that in a moment when she's looking for work at the saloon and when you have w earl brown's character say oh the lovely companion of of olsen it you know there's this little moment that uh vicky creeps has in just in terms of like a small expression that completely surprises you and and you're completely drawn into the performance and thinking mm -hmm. about that as well, I was curious, was there anything in terms of her performance as not just an actor, but a great technician that surprised you as a director and co-star? Well, generally speaking, 
Vicky gave us more than I dreamed uh, she would. Uh, I mean, I knew she'd be great as Vivian, but she just added layers. Just her, I mean, I knew she had this ability, but seeing it in practice was was great. It was a gift. The, her ability to to transmit so much, even in silence, was really important. It was something I'd hoped Vivian would be like, you know. It's, it's important in our story. It's often as important what's not said as what is said. It's as important what is not shown as what is shown in our movie. But you need really good actors. And with Vicky, but I have to say, with other actors like Solly McLeod, who's a real discovery, who plays Weston, the bad guy, um, these are people who are really technically great, but also have a good screen presence. You know, she... I mean, Vicky, the first time I saw her in the Phantom Thread 2017 movie by Paul Thomas Anderson, when I first saw her, I was, you know, really impacted by her strong screen presence, you know, that ability to, to communicate so much emotion and thought, even in silence. It reminded me of the first time, first couple of times I saw Meryl Streep, you know, years before on screen and she she has that kind of power so I, you know i was really happy when she said she wanted to play the role we knew then that we could make an original western with a really strong um original female character at the center of the story yeah and 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 you feel that and, I, and i'm glad that you mentioned uh, paul thomas anderson's movie because i feel like that's where a lot of people really did discover her and then obviously even with something like bergman's island where like she continues to find sort of new avenues to explore and, and characters that you're completely drawn into um, just as an audience and, and watching that. Um, another thing that I was curious to know more about you, you mentioned it in terms of um, sound. You also composed the score for this and, and Falling and Hauha. Um, with this, are, are you more aware of the sound design when you're shooting as well to complement the more kind of classical elements with the score? Because things that I noticed in this movie that I really was taken aback by that you don't really hear in Westerns because you think about like artifice with, with Westerns, especially like yeah. the classic Hollywood films is like the sound of flies or breathing and yeah. just those little moments. Yeah. I mean, to me, I've always thought of sound design and music. They should complement each other. And they're actually, they are joined. They're not, they're not separate elements to me, even though you'd, you, you work on them separately to, you know, to a large degree. <clears throat> and to me, they're all part of the ongoing writing of the story in a way. You know, you start writing words and then you show the script to people, you adapt to the locations you find, you adapt to the actors that you cast and how the day goes. And, you know, the script sort of changes a little. And with the music, that's something that, as I did with Fall, that we, uh, I mean, I composed and, and recorded all that music well before the shoot started, um, based on the script, talking with the musicians, saying this is for this scene or this sequence or this transition, and this is what it should feel like, and here's, here's what I've come up with. Let's work on that. And so it's really connected to the script. And then before shooting starts, you know, I'd play that music, for the cinematographer and other members of the crew just to give them an idea of what the the tone the mood should be in certain sequences what the rhythm even the duration of scenes uh, and as a way of explaining why i wanted to have a certain amount of shots but no more you know very specific it's part of preparing and, and ongoing writing and, and it's very good as a guide i mean i found it very useful as a guide for the shoot and then the editing and then the sounds you know I, like a lot of times directors with with the people who are recording sound for a movie they sort of hire them very late they come on board and then often on a shoot you'll see people going wow we're just waiting on sound waiting them to place their mics and geez get ready and i didn't i don't like that i think the sound is as important as anything uh, for setting the tone and for telling the story and so months before we started shooting, I was conversing with, with the guy who did the sound, Gabriel Cole. And 
and talking to him and he would say, well, we could put mics here and there. I said, do it, do it. You want to put a mic in a saddle? You want to put it somewhere on the horse? So you hear all these sounds and, or the sound of spurs, you know, I don't want to mute them and then find some generic spur clinking sound later. I want, when we hear Western spurs, we know he's coming before we see him, for example. And there's flies buzzing around and all that. And on some shoots, they would say, well, don't worry about that. We'll just, we'll record some ambient sound and without flies and we'll replace those flies. I didn't want to, that's, that's real. That's what, what's there. That's what would have been there. So all those sounds are extremely important. And at that time, even more so than now, because there's no sounds of automobiles in the distance. There's no planes, there's no modern sounds. Um, there's less people and you hear, you would hear all these things and they add something to, to what's happening emotionally. So, you know, we worked really hard in post-production on, on accentuating what we had recorded and adding some other sounds. And we were very careful. You hear birds, but we were very specific. We're looking for bird sounds that were specific to that region, not just, well, that's a great sounding hawk. But then you look it up and you go, well, actually that's a hawk from, Africa that it would never be there so let's not do that not that people would notice that but it's in the details I think if you the more you concentrate on specific things whether it's sound or dialects or you know uh, body language and you're specific to the time and place that you're telling the story in um, the more universal the story is going to be hopefully Absolutely. And, and it brings an authenticity to it. It doesn't feel like it's like you mentioned, like it's Foley artists or, you know, post-production in, in that way that it's it's real in, in the moments. Um, and it's I a have... mixture. You obviously do that. You always use some Foley. I mean, there are great Foley artists and they find things. But if you guide, if you say, well, I want it to be specific to that period, that time, then you find certain sounds that are right. And then they'll see what's going on on screen. And they too are inspired by what they hear when they first watch the movie. Like, okay, we're doing this for real. Let's be very specific. You know? and, and a really good Foley artist is invaluable, of course, and that adds to it. Absolutely. Now, I do have to wrap with you, but I quickly want to ask one question I've always been curious about. Um, cause I, and I'll try to relate it back to the, the dead don't hurt because you do have a couple Cronenberg actors in this movie with John Getz and Nadia Litz, which you just worked with, uh, for crimes of the future. Um, and, and John Getz obviously in the fly and he's done amazing work with, with Kelly Reichardt and, and the Coen brothers in, in, um, blood simple. Um, but in terms of your working uh, relationship with David Cronenberg, who had a cameo in falling as well, uh, there's a behind the scenes documentary on, um, a history of history violence, violence where at the end of uh the, the the film Cronenberg gives you a Toronto Maple Leaf jersey uh <laughs> did you ever give David Cronenberg a Canadian's jersey uh in terms of um you know paying it back to him um well that was him and his crew because they 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 were sick and tired of me you know whenever I was, I was off screen especially if I was committing some act of violence during that shoot you know, I'd put a Hab sweater on or some something from the Canadians, right? Yeah. And um, that was their payback. At the end of the shoot, they said, you have to wear this, you know, Leafs sweater for the crew photo. I said, I can't. They said, no, you have to because you've done this to us the whole shoot and so forth. I said, okay. So what I did is I put a Montreal Canadiens cap on and wore that. And that was the compromise. But, but yeah, sure. I mean, I've given... David an award and presented a you know Canadian's flag while doing so, or certainly, you know, press conferences or whatever with dangerous method. I remember getting um getting uh, our lead actress to wear a Guy Lafleur sweater, um, you know, things like that. Um, yeah, sure. It's it goes back and forth. But it's just fun, obviously. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I have a brother, you know, who is a Boston fan and a best friend who's a uh, Leafs fan and their buddies as well. And uh, they usually, you know, are on good terms until, you know, the playoffs come and then it's radio silence. So it's one of those things where it's like it, they take it very personally sometimes. So it's, yeah. it's good that you have that relationship. But I want to thank you so much for taking I don't think he's I don't think I think he actually, David, I don't think he's he cares a lot more about baseball than he does hockey. I think he's a, okay. he's a real baseball man. 
Well, that's 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 good to know. But uh, thank you so much for for taking the time to do this. I really do appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, he's a Blue Jays fan all the way. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I, yeah. I'm Mets. I did take. I remember one time we were showing, may have been History of Violence in New York, History of Violence or Eastern Promises, maybe I can't remember. And I took him to see the Mets play in the old uh, Shea Stadium. And it wasn't against a, a Canadian team, but but it was uh, a Mets game when he came. And he's, he likes baseball, so that was fun. I would have never guessed that, honestly. Like, I, because, you know, I, I'm not a big sports person in general. I'm more of just a, sort of a bystander and sort of watching from the point of view of seeing friends and family that are very invested in it. So it's always interesting when, um, you know, you, you see someone that maybe isn't fitting the stereotype of the Canadian aspect, but yeah, I'm, I'm getting. Well, the, I think David is, uh, David is, I think he, my impression is he likes the, the statistics, the mathematics of baseball uh, a lot. I don't know if that's true, but it seems that way to me. Yeah. Well, um, Vigo Mortensen, I really do appreciate uh, the, the time that you've given me and um, thank you so much. And, and thank you for the film. I really, really love the movie and, and um, it was great watching it again, too. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tom. I really appreciate it. Hey, and if you, want, if you want to listen to the soundtrack, it's available on Spotify, the full soundtrack of the movie. Excellent. And I hope that it gets a, a Blu-ray release as well, because I'd love to, to, to you it's know, going to. Bit. Yeah. Excellent. It's going to, and there'll be a couple, a few additional scenes, and I'm making a uh, piece that we made as well. Awesome, awesome, yeah, because I really did love, like, even the nonverbal communications between you and Garrett Delahunt's character with uh, the sheriff's badge, and uh, you know, putting it mm -hmm. down in one moment, and then you know, flashing it towards him, and not having that dialogue at all between those two characters, I thought was really well done. But um, yeah, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I'm sure that you're you have to go to another interview, and and Tom has been very gracious, so thanks. Thank you. Bye.